What's the number one thing holding you back right now that we could unlock for you? Where if you look back three to five years from now and said that this LSAT coaching session with Steve today changed everything for you, what would have to happen? Right now, I'm just having trouble with necessary assumption questions. So if I could just understand those type of questions and not feel less confident about it, I think that would, that would make an impact five years from now. I feel like that's really holding me back. Yeah. Yeah. Necessary assumption questions are, of course, a major question type. And so if you can unlock those, then the benefit will carry forward to everything else in logical reasoning as a whole, really. Mm -hmm. But they are one of the most common question types. So I'm glad that you identified them as a particular area of focus. Now, for necessary assumption questions, how do you currently approach them? Well, I first look at this um, question stem and then then if it's like a flaw, then I just read the stimulus and then find the premise conclusion and then try to find the flaw. So, Yeah, perfect. So what in the question stem is telling you is necessary assumption versus sufficient assumption? Do you feel like you have a good handle on the difference? Yeah, like required or there's other words, assumed. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you got it. So exactly words that are synonymous with necessity, like depends upon, requires, and assumes. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you have a good handle on the, on the difference there. Mm -hmm. So you said the re you read the question stem, then yeah. the stimulus, yeah. and then you move on to the answer choices. Yeah. Now, is there a particular technique that you use when you're evaluating the stimulus or the answer choices? I know I take the, I forgot what it's called, the contrapositive. I can't remember. When, when you look at the stimulus, if it's a quantity word, you change it. If it's a verb, you put the not or no. Oh, so like negating. Negating, yeah, yeah. That's what I do. But it's still, like sometimes it's hard. I guess with practice. Yeah, practice will definitely help. But I want to see if there's maybe something conceptual that we can dig into a little bit. I'm looking at your question here. You wrote, when I solve necessary assumption questions, Sometimes I can't think of an assumption. Yeah. What's your advice for this? So that's a great question. I, I think that you don't always need to prephrase or predict what the underlying assumption is because there could potentially be multiple mm -hmm. underlying necessary assumptions. I think that necessary assumption questions fall into two categories. One where you can predict it and that prediction would simply be the connection between the evidence and the conclusion. Because mm -hmm. in the argument, they may not be connected at all, so your job is simply to connect them because they need to be connected mm -hmm. in order for the argument to work. But then there is that other category where in necessary assumption questions, you want to simply defend the alternative against potential problems and say that potential alternative explanations or scenarios. And so in those cases, there may be multiple things that the argument needs to be defended against and you wouldn't possibly predict all of them. Mm -hmm. And how would you know that which, which road to take, like if you bridge it or you protect it? That's a good question. I think that you're not always going to know. Okay. But one indicator is that if you see something totally new that never appeared in the evidence, but does appear in the conclusion, then you're like, well, this new thing in the conclusion, its presence there is not justified. Mm. And so in order for the argument to, argument to work, that new thing in the conclusion would then need to be linked back to the evidence. So I think in most cases where you have something totally out of left field in mm -hmm. the conclusion, that particular new thing will also appear in the answer choice. Yeah. And that new thing in the answer choice will also be linked back to something that was in the evidence. Yeah, that's really helpful. Because sometimes I just, I have no assumption in my head and then... I just go to the answer choices and I negate them and I just, it makes no sense. But I think now that I know that if there's something out just different in the conclusion, I know that I have to kind of link it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're negating and mm -hmm. how do you feel like your negating negation skills are overall? I think they're pretty good. Like I have a table. So if there's, if I, if there's a word in the, answer choice and it's like some or most I kind of refer to my table and I'm trying to like memorize the table at the same time for the quantify words okay good that's perfect so yeah so for quantifier words negations are really important 
Yeah. And then for verbs, like you said, you just add the word not, or you might remove yeah. the word not. But what about negating conditional statements? Mm. Do you, how, how does that work for you? I think I do the same. I, is that not right? Well, it's, it's, tr it's more complicated because if you, if you have a conditional statement, there could be multiple subjects and verbs. Mm. And your job in that case wouldn't necessarily be to negate a particular verb. You're actually looking to negate the conditional as a whole. Mm -hmm. So if I had, for example, the statement X requires Y, and I said negate that entire statement, mm -hmm. how, how might you handle it? This, so, gets, a, this gets a bit mm, trickier. Not Y, not X? Well, that's the contrapositive. Oh, negate. Oh. Yeah, I don't it's know. It's hard. It's hard. Yes. Some yeah. X, some Y. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. So the contrapositive, you're absolutely right, would be not Y arrow, not X. And that's mm -hmm. logically equivalent to the original. Mm -hmm. But let's say we put the statement in quotes, like X arrow Y, and I'm saying negate that entire statement mm -hmm. in quotes. The statement is saying that X requires Y. Mm -hmm. So to negate that, we'd be saying X does not necessarily require Y. Mm -hmm. So you're actually negating the arrow itself mm -hmm. because the arrow is the word requires. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But it could get a bit trickier if we say, and this gets into more tough logical reasoning questions, like if, if A requires B, then C requires D. Mm -hmm. Then that's like a whole mess, right? Because you have two conditionals within a larger conditional statement. Mm -hmm. so again, that's A require, if A requires B, then C requires D. Mm -hmm. So... In that case, we're not negating either of those individual requires words, terms related to A and B and C and D, because those are not at core in the statement as a whole. Mm -hmm. That statement as a whole is saying that if one conditional is true, then the second conditional is also true. Mm -hmm. So how would you negate that? Well, let's, let's relate it back to our earlier example with X and Y. Let's say that X equals A arrow B. Mm -hmm. and y equals c arrow d. Mm -hmm. So if you break it down that way, then again, it's the link between x and y. So a requiring b would not necessarily lead to c requiring d. Okay. Okay. If there's double, if there's if it's not a conditional answer choice, but it, if it has two quantifiers, if it's like a double negative, mm -hmm. or how would you find the negation? So if it's a double, or, if, if, you, if you had a double negative, mm -hmm. then I'd want you to first convert that into a positive. Okay, both of them? Or? Well, maybe, maybe it's easier if we have a, a concrete example. Mm -hmm. I, I, could I could make one up here. So let's say okay. that... I do, not, I do not lack LSAT books. Okay. If I don't lack LSAT books, that means that I have LSAT books. Mm -hmm. So then from there, if you want to negate, I have LSAT books, you say, I do not have LSAT books. Okay. So it just, it just the, double, the double negative adds an extra step. Okay. And so it's like one more layer you have to peel away to get to a simple way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I found an answer choice. It's an assumption question. Can I read it for you? Yeah, of course. Is this okay. one of the ones that you sent me? Um, no. That's I okay. That's okay. It's What's the prep test number? 31. Okay. Yeah, I'll pull it up. But in the in meantime, you want to just read it? Okay. Section three and question 21. Okay. Yeah. You want to read it out loud? Sure. So... Maybe not the whole thing, but just that particular answer choice. Yeah. For B, people who are not athletes require neither stronger connective tissue nor muscle strength. So to negate that. Yeah, that's a tricky one. So people who aren't athletes, so non-athletes, mm -hmm. require neither one of these two things. Mm -hmm. So non-athletes, that's obviously a bit, let's just say ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Ordinary people don't need stronger connective tissue and they also don't need muscle strength. Mm -hmm. So the word nor 
is kind of like and in the negative, just saying that they don't need both of these things. Yeah. That's the original formulation. Once we've removed that negative thing about people saying people who are not athletes, we just say for our own purposes, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Ordinary people don't require either one of those two things, Mm -hmm. meaning they don't require both of them. Mm -hmm. So to negate that, we want to say that these ordinary people do require at least one of these two things. Okay. Okay. So the ad, the nor is like a, a negative and. Mm-hmm. So you're li- they're they're not require they're they're not requiring either one. Negation means they must have at least one of the two, which would be like an or. Okay. So ordinary people do require at least one of the stronger connective tissue or the muscle strength. Mm-hmm. So I think what's going on here a little bit is just that there's that extra step and it requires a bit of slowing down. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's an only like for answer choice E, yeah. For how would you negate the only? Is that so would it be that. not only? So growth of muscle mass enhances the strength only when accompanied by growth of connective tissue. So that's that only when is another conditional indicator. Yeah. Only when is like only if it's a necessary indicator. Mm-hmm. So that's like the arrow. Okay. Growth of mass enhances strength when only when accompanied by growth of connective tissue. So mm-hmm. they're saying it only happens under these particular circumstances. Mm-hmm. So to negate that, we'd say it could happen under a variety of circumstances, not necessarily these specific ones. Mm. So you could say, I, I sleep only when I'm tired. Mm-hmm. To negate that, you could say, I sleep even when I might not be tired. Mm. So not only under these particular circumstances. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. How does this feel right now? Just kind of walking yeah, through these. I, yeah, I feel more confident. I feel like this is what, what I was struggling with. Because looking back at all the questions that I missed, I usually crossed off the answer choices that I didn't understand. But now I think if I know how to negate them correctly, I'll... I'll know when to cross them off or not. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it looks like you've been diving in quite a bit to some of the specifics. Which resources of mine have you been using? Just reading your blogs. <laughs> oh yeah, have you looked at the logical yeah. reasoning stuff? Yeah, I saw the list, so I'm trying to go through that and just review. Awesome. Of all the types of questions, yeah. Great, great, sweet. All right, so you want to look at some of these other logical reasoning questions that you sent me? Sure. So I saw that a couple of the ones you sent me were from tests in the 30s as well, test 30 and test 34. Yeah. Both necessary assumptions in particular. Mm-hmm. This might be a good place to dive in. Okay. Test 30, section four, number 19, with the birds needing energy. Yeah. And this one's a little bit unique because it's t- talking about questionable assumptions in particular. So they're telling us that the argument is flawed, but they're still asking about what is an underlying necessary assumption. Mm-hmm. So how, did, how was this one going for you? What, what, what in particular might have given you trouble on this one? Um, well, I just, I thought the whole stimulus was about energy, food energy, about the birds. And I did this question like twice, once in like September and then again. Mm-hmm. And I missed it both times. And I just, it just, I don't know. And then when I look at the right answer choice, it wasn't about food energy. Yeah, yeah. It's about quantity or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's the conclusion here in this argument? Um. Yeah, I think what I underlined. Yes, you underlined would surely show that the seed eating bird spends more time eating than does the nectar eating bird. Mm Mm-hmm. Since, so then going back to evidence. So yeah, you're absolutely right. That is the conclusion. Yeah. So is there something new in the conclusion that's not in the evidence here? Um, the more time eating? Yeah, so time, right? Yeah. Time's in the conclusion, mm-hmm. but not in the evidence. Mm-hmm. What's in the evidence? The food energy. Exactly. So time is new. It's a mm-hmm. new claim made in the conclusion 
that does mm -hmm. not appear earlier. So like we said earlier, like we said earlier in our conversation, that suggests that that time thing will need to derive some sort of necessary assumption about it in order mm -hmm. for the argument to work. And so if we look, scan through the choices here, only one of them refers to time. Yeah. Okay. And that's, it's, it's really is as simple as that, just if we, if we mm -hmm. focus on what's new in the conclusion. Okay. Yeah. I think that's probably what I was doing wrong. Sweet. Awesome. Now, you've been using the negation test. Yeah. What other methods have you been using to inform your understanding of necessary assumptions? Is there any other way you like to think about them? Um, no, like just negation. Yeah, that's okay. all I do when I look at the answer choices. Well, I want to share one other technique with you that might be helpful for necessary assumptions, which is I want you to start thinking about them like a very specific kind of inference question or a very specific kind of must be true question. Mm -hmm. Because the necessary assumption is not really new information. It's something that already needs to have been true in order for the argument to work. Like I said, meaning that it's inherent or contained within the stimulus already, mm -hmm. not new information. So if we look at choice C here, it might seem very moderate because we already know it based on the stimulus. Mm -hmm. is talking about time spent eating. The stimulus is talking about time spent eating. But for that very reason, it's true. Mm -hmm. It's already known and it needs to be the case for this argument to work. And the fact here in this particular case that it's questionable doesn't really matter a whole lot. Bottom line is that it is something we already know. I don't want to focus just on necessary assumption questions here because I saw that there are some other things you were asking about and I want to make sure we cover those at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. You were asking about flaw questions and abstract language and answer choices. Yeah. You want to share a little more on that? Um, just sometimes the wording of the answer choices are like so complicated and it just takes time to like, it just makes no sense sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I totally hear you. The LSAT <laughs> uses a lot of complex or abstract language. Yeah. But the flaw is like, if you understand it and you know that the flaw is not the same as the stimulus. So I don't know how you go about <laughs> understanding the abstract language. Does it ever happen to you where you read a stimulus and you have a sense of what the flaw is, but then you don't see it in the choices? Yeah. yeah that that's, happens to me all the time. It happens to a lot of folks all the time. And there's a way to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Way to deal with it is to just go through these answer choices and actually figure out what every single one means. Actually slow down, take the time for every word you don't know, every mm -hmm. phrase you don't know, you could Google it if you want. You could look online for like lists of flaws and such just to really break it down in everyday simple language. Mm -hmm. And do that as an exercise. Do okay. it for all five answer choices, not even just the correct one or just the one that you may have picked the first time around. Because mm -hmm. words and phrases, they're not things we talk about in everyday life, like antecedent, consequent, subsidiary conclusion, counter premise. Mm -hmm. These are all abstract terms. Mm -hmm. and that if there was one thing I would ever suggest memorizing on the LSAT, it would be this mm -hmm. sort of thing, just vocabulary. Every time you see a word you don't know, keep a running list and actually look them up. It's mm -hmm. too easy to just move on and go on to the next thing. But these things, of course, do repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to do is go on my site. I have a categorization of logical reasoning questions by type. And mm -hmm. specifically, I have a list of flaw questions there. And so you can practice just doing lots of flaw questions and specifically go through all five choices and look up those definitions. Yeah. Okay. And if a stimulus have, has multiple flaws, how do you know, like, is the answer choice? I don't know. How do you know which flaw to focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. There, there's usually one major flaw in a logical reasoning question. Mm -hmm. There could be a tiny little other side issue, but there's usually one big thing. Mm -hmm. And so it really just is practice to figure out what LSAC considers to be the one big thing. But I think that as your understanding improves, yeah. you'll kind of come around to their way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And just as a side note, when there is a question that refers to two flaws, mm -hmm. like which of the following exhibits both of the flaws above or something like that. for mm -hmm. so, so occasionally a parallel flaw question will do that or a regular parallel question might do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so it really is important to take the time to figure out what both of those flaws are. Yeah. 
Okay. Typically, if you ID one of those flaws, you'll be able to eliminate at least a few of the choices, mm -hmm. but you won't be able to get all the way to the correct answer without knowing what both of them are. Mm -hmm. And there have been a handful of those over the years. And again, look at the flaw categorization on my site and you'll, you'll come across those every now and then too. Okay. Yeah, so, those were the two that I just keep missing in my... Yeah, the two LR ones. And then you had a question on games also, right? Yeah, that, that might just be me. Maybe I don't feel... I haven't done more practice, but sometimes there's games that the rules are just a little weird like wording that I've never seen before. And then I can't make my own table because of the wording of the rules. So I skip. Sometimes I don't know if it's best to skip the game or how much time should you give yourself to try to solve it before skipping? Yeah, I totally hear you. That's one of those things where I think that you have to decide at a certain point to cut your losses and move on. Mm -hmm. Where if you are investing minute after minute and just things are not clicking, then of course it is time to skip. But I'm wondering, Tamara, how, how much practice have you done so far? I've done like about 20 prep tests. 20 prep tests, so that means 80 yeah. games? Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good number so far. Mm -hmm. But what I, I would encourage you to actually do more. Okay. And you, you've, got, you've got time, right? When are you taking the LSAT? I'm thinking June, but I'm not sure. I wanna take it in July. Yeah. Cool. So that means that you've got a good amount of time and I would recommend actually taking both exams because the gap between them isn't that big. So yeah. it's not that much additional effort to go another five, six weeks to study for it. Yeah. And now you mentioned once, I don't know when you said it, but you said you did games like over 20 times, like specific games. And I started doing that too, but I'm seeing that I miss it. I miss some questions sometimes. How do you know like what to look at if you keep missing a certain question or if you've done it like 10 times and out of nowhere you miss a, a question in the game? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. I'd say that sometimes things are just careless, okay. but if there's a conceptual roadblock you're having about how to diagram a rule or how to make sense of a rule, then it's worth taking some time on that. Maybe you look at explanations. I have Logic Games video explanations on my YouTube channel where I walk through the vast majority of games ever released and just seeing how I do it. There's other explanations out there too. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to look at them if there is something that you just cannot crack on your own. Mm -hmm. so I'd say expectations yeah. plus doing the games more times and then exposing yourself to more games overall. Mm -hmm. 20 exams is great, mm -hmm. but you have the time to do potentially 30 or 40 exams. Yeah. And you don't have to do all of those exams. You could focus specifically mm -hmm. on doing the games portions if games is giving you particular trouble. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, but I just want, I don't want to miss like any on the real exam, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And so if you don't want to miss any, then I, that's a great goal, of course. And I would say for that reason, you definitely want to do the games from at least 40 exams and maybe beyond that. Mm -hmm. and you also want to do the oldest exams because they contain some kind of weird curveball type stuff that you're seeing on the newer exams as well. So I want you to expose yourself to a wide variety mm -hmm. so that you're not thrown off by anything that might come your way. Mm -hmm. Okay. The games, they really do repeat themselves. And so if there's a particular rule that you can't make sense of, mm -hmm. then it's probably worth understanding it well because it will come up again. Yeah. And so slow down, take the time to thoroughly understand the rule. Because if there's mm -hmm. any rule you don't understand, then of course everything will fall apart with that game because that, mm -hmm. most of the questions yeah. will involve all the rules in some way. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I know when I redo games, I feel like I'm just trying to memorize it how I did it before, like after watching the videos, like how do they make their tables? Is that a good strategy or should I just start making my own? Yeah, that's a fair question. I'd, I'd say that ultimately other systems can give you some guidance on how to diagram, mm -hmm. but also find what works best for you. Mm -hmm. So if there's, a, if there's a case where there's a system that you see online and it's not really clicking, then mm -hmm. try out something else. Look at a different explanation source or try to come up with your own thing. But I typically recommend looking at the explanations and adopting one of those systems because they're tried and true and honed over many, many years. And they might be more efficient or more concise than whatever you might come up with. Okay. 
So just practice. <laughs> yeah, basically just practice is the biggest thing, of course, and mm -hmm. figuring out what works for you with different systems out there. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a lot of fun and I appreciate your taking the time. Any other questions you would need to feel complete before we sign off for today? Mm, no, I feel like I've touched all my main questions with you. Thank Great. you for giving me all the advice. <laughs> of course, my pleasure. But before we go, what's the biggest insight you got from our session today? Um, probably necessary assumption. I didn't know I was doing the negation for the conditionals wrong. I thought I was just doing the negation if the quantifier words, but I realized I did it completely wrong. And I think that will probably change the game for all my necessary assumption questions from now on. Awesome. That's great to hear. So what I want you to do going forward over the next week or so is mm -hmm. drill at least 50 necessary assumption questions, mm -hmm. specifically looking for ones with quantifiers yeah. and negating them. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that in the flaw questions too. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. please keep in touch as you move forward with your prep. I really am happy to help however I can as you move forward to June and July and beyond. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.